Good morning. Um, we are going to start in a, just a few seconds. If you can make yourselves comfortable. Um, in the meantime, just before we start, um, we'll check with Secretariat if there are any announcements that need to be made before before we start with our meeting, and then we'll take those and uh, and then move on to to the program. Good morning, everyone. Just the two housekeeping announcements. So those of you who have not provided yet their credentials, please submit them to the registration desk as soon as possible. A reminder to the credentials committee that there will be a meeting during the coffee break in the morning. So please do proceed to the meeting room and in the secretariat. And the second announcement is uh, for the sponsored delegates, uh, just to let you know that all cash cards have been loaded and you could access your, your funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm aware that uh, they, they may be or there will be an announcement regarding the invitation that uh, the provincial government of uh, KwaZulu-Natal uh, led by the MEC, uh, who gave a speech in the beginning of the, uh, this uh, meeting, um, has um, extended an invite to host a dinner on Friday, 7th of December 20, 2018, um, leaving here um, any time just after six, we'll give you the details of that for people to be at the, the we call it Moses Mabida Stadium. There's a, a stadium built for the World Cup that you may have seen as you were coming over. It's not far, it's just four minutes or five minutes from here um, on, on, on Friday. So just need to let you know. There will be details provided as we, as we move along. So those are the few announcements that we needed to, to go through. I hope all of you have rested well after uh, last night's uh, uh, dinner at uh, Ushaka Marine World. Uh, what an interesting area, uh, very educative, recreational and informative. Um, today's program, um, we still have two issues or two items that we were supposed to have done and concluded yesterday. We, and those two items were assigned 45 minutes to go through. Um, our time is very, very tight. You will see we're trying yesterday not to, to wave to speakers or those that are introducing items. Uh, today we will try, without disturbing the meeting or the flow, just to make sure that at least we can recover five minutes each minimum as we go through the program, uh, so that by, by lunchtime at least we have 30 minutes and then we are left with uh, another 15 minutes to recover after lunch, um, so that we conclude at half past four with all the agenda items introduced. Of course, I see here we've lost 15 minutes already. Um, so agenda item 15 is the first one. These are agenda items that are very, very important. They, 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 they also have draft resolutions, if you can look at those. These are agenda items on agenda item 15 and agenda item 16 in particular. They look at um, the Iowa strategic plan, and the other one looks at the um, plan of action for Africa for the same period 2019 to 2027. So we'll start with agenda item 15. Sergey is going to be taking us through that. Um, and this one looks at the Iowa strategic plan 2019 to 2027. 20, the document uh, reference is uh, document 7.15. Um, um, available to all the parties. Uh, CJ. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone, once again. It's a good way to start the second day of the conference with the look forward. 
for the next decade, next three intersessional cycles. And I'll briefly introduce the draft strategic plan for the period 2019-2017. First, please uh, let me just remind you about the background and uh, how the process was run. The production of the new strategic plans mandated by MOP 6 in 2015 through Resolution 6.14. And it was compiled by a working group which consisted of the Standing Committee, the full Standing Committee, plus the European Union, and nine other parties that volunteered to participate in the working group. We also had nine out of the 16 technical committee members. We had also observer and partner organizations involved in the working group. It was compiled within the period of June 2016 to July 2017, and it started with a facilitated workshop that took place in uh, the premises of the Secretariat in Bonn in June 2016. It took two consultation rounds and three drafts to finalize this, uh, this plan. It was agreed by the working group in July 2017 and approved by the Standing Committee for submission to the meeting of the parties in July this year. And the final product was also used as the foundation for the production of the Plan of Action for Africa, about which you, you are going to hear in the next presentation. So what's the structure of the new plan? It's not very di different in terms of structure from the current one that you have. So you have the strategic plan goal. I'm not going to read it out. I assume you have studied the document in depth already. You have the purpose of the plan, uh, which looks, so the, the goal is the long-term aspiration of, of the agreement where it wants uh, to achieve its, fun, uh, its ultimate uh, uh, goal. The purpose is the road within the next nine years until 2027. There are six indicators which are And we're back. There are six indicators which are linked to the purpose to assess how much we have actually managed to achieve in 2027. They set up a threshold between 50 to 75 percent uh, related to a stable or increasing trend in six groups of, pop of water bird populations. The first one is the populations with known trends. It's already an indicator we have used in the current strategic plan. The second one is the so-called priority populations, and there is a definition in the plan what priority populations constitute. The third group is populations in unfavorable conservation status. The fourth one are the harvested populations. Uh, there might be an overlap, actually, with the previous one. The fifth one is the populations which are highly dependent on site network, those which are gregarious uh, species. And the last group is the dispersed populations. So this is how we are going to measure the success of the strategic plan in, 19, in 2027, according to these six indicators. The strategic plan has five objectives. Four of them are substantive and one is enabling objective. The first one is related to species recovery and reduction of the causes of mortality. The second one is related to sustainable use and population management. The third one is related to the site network. 
The fourth one is a new objective compared to the current plan. The, pre the previous three, they have been already objectives of the current plan. The new one looks at the conservation of the wider habitat in the wider landscape. This is something which under AWA hasn't been addressed yet. But it has been discussed uh, as, as uh, one of the conclusions in many of the reports that have been produced that uh, it's not sufficient enough just to address conservation within confined sites. You need to provide conservation in the broader landscape. And the fifth one is the enabling objective, uh, which aims at strengthening the knowledge, capacity, recognition, awareness, and resources. So all these items, which are important preconditions, as it was already mentioned so far, but could not achieve actually conservation output unless you implement all the other uh, tasks related to the uh, previous four objectives. There are 27 targets across the five objectives, and there are between four and six, six targets per objective. For each target, we have indicators and means of verification. We have stepwise actions be between MOB 8, 9, and 10. So basically, the strategic plan goes a step further into an implementation plan and gives the hint towards how actions should be implemented in order to deliver on each of the targets. Main actors, which have been identified already at this point of the time, of course, this is not an exhaustive list and it's quite a broad brush. And key resources available. Uh, this does not refer to financial resources, but this refers to other resources. And also, the last uh, column of the log frame of the plan indicates the contributions of the new strategic plan to the sustainable development goals, to the Aichi targets, and to the strategic plan for migratory species, as well as it, it establishes some linkages to the, uh, uh, the Heritage Convention and the Ramsar Convention. In addition to that, there have been several overarching and cross-cutting issues that have been identified which need to be considered whenever a task is being implemented. The first one is climate change. It affects all of us. It affects water birds. It affects their habitats. So this needs to be taken into account in any action we're undertaking. The next one is indigenous and local communities poverty alleviation and gender equality, communication, education, and public awareness. It's an important component of every action that we need to undertake. Capacity building, science-based approach, and a couple of operational principles. The first one is the alignment of all strategic documents and work plans under AVA. And the second one is the use of the national reporting uh, as a monitoring uh, mechanism for the implementation of the strategic plan. This is something that has been done so far. It's not a novelty. So in order to conclude this presentation, I just want to show a picture, because they say a picture is better than a thousand words. So if, if you ask me what picture would best illustrate the current draft strategic plan, I would use this picture. It's a beautifully constructed mechanism, and we just need to make it work. We need to give it the energy in order to make all the elements within it move and work and deliver. And finally, just a vote of thanks. Uh, this process, of course, uh, needed quite some resources. Thank you to the Italian Ministry for the Environment, Land and Sea, to the European Commission, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands, and the Minister of Environment of the Czech Republic for providing funds for running this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, we'll open the floor for questions or comments. Um, I think we'll 
be so much in favor of comments that would be noted to assist taking this forward, noting that um, the very same issue is going to be subject to discussion in the working group. Just wanted to give you the introduction to what it covers and you have the documents. Um, but if it's anything that will assist uh, the process or a point of clarity, that would be helpful. I saw Switzerland. Um, I saw Estonia, um, South Africa, Uganda, uh, is that Norway? And Norway, okay. Let's start with Switzerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Switzerland congratulates to the new strategic plan proposed for adoption. In particular, we welcome the stepwise actions from mob to mob and the fact that to each target a specific indicator allows monitoring the effectiveness of our actions until the next mob. Thank you to all of those who contributed. However, Switzerland is concerned and cannot understand that on one hand a very ambitious strategic plan is on the table and on the other hand the necessary resources neither in the Secretariat nor in the Technical Committee nor for implementation on the ground seems to be secured. If no further resources are found, we are very concerned to bleed out our agreement. That must not be allowed to happen. Since we all support the necessity of a strong AEWA post-2020, Switzerland calls on all parties to consider a core budget increase in the upcoming discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Estonia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to everybody. The EU and its member states uh, recognize the work uh, done with the, by the Standing Committee and uh, Technical Committee and Working Groups of the IVA Strategic Plan and the Plan of Action for Africa for a period of uh, 19 20, till 2027. We welcome uh, the new uh, strategic plan as a framework, uh, setting uh, out relevant actions aimed at uh, maintaining migratory water bird species and their populations or to restoring them to such a status uh, throughout their flyways. The new draft uh, strategic plan is very comprehensive, uh, but having uh, regard to limitations in progress under the current plan and continuing resource uh, constraints, it is uh, over ambitious for the next uh, period. While understanding that it is uh, for contracting parties to define their priorities in the uh, priorities, the EU and its member states are convinced uh, that it is also of high importance to recognize uh, further prioritization at the uh, plan stage. Identifying the most critical actions to be achieved in the next period. It will allow efforts and resources to focus uh, on the most needed actions uh, in a coordinated uh, way along the African Eurasian Flyway. The EU and its member states consider that a key focus uh, of the targets set by the strategic plan and the plan of action for Africa should be uh, declining water bird populations. We would uh, also ask the Secretary to include this EU position in the uh, minutes of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Estonia. We have of EU, Uganda. Uganda, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> Uganda, on behalf of uh, Africa region, welcomes uh, the new strategic plan for Iowa, and we are happy to support the new strategic plan uh, in its uh, current form. We call upon all contracting parties of Iowa to support uh, allocation of significant resources for implementation of this strategic plan as a good plan without a budget for its implementation uh, would not make any difference uh, to the conservation status of migratory species. Uh, we look forward uh, to having this uh, further discussed in the budget uh, uh, working group 
to ensure that uh, this strategic plan is actually translated from paper to real action on ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uganda, South Africa. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to those that have provided inputs on this matter. Uh, we also support the strategic plan as we're involved in its uh, uh, compilation. Uh, it is a very balanced uh, approach to water beds conservation, looking at issues of conservation as well as issues of well human well-being, particularly objective two of the of the strategic plan on sustainable use and management of populations. <clears throat> However, we would request that obje objective to be strengthened to look at issues of implementing the sustainable development goals, particularly uh, goal number one, two, and three on poverty reduction, on hunger, on human well-being. That can be reflected in activities relate related or targets related to objective two, which is very highly appreciated because it makes the plan um, a, a very a accepted by, by national priorities, which are looking at developing the human well-being with all the conservation activities. As other speakers have really alluded to, it will be very um, supportive if this strategic plan discussions are linked with the issues of budget and financial mechanisms on the other side, because an ambitious strategic plan like this one requires adequate and timely resources for its implementation, particularly considering the report that was given by the Secretariat yesterday on the staff needs within the Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you very much, South Africa. Norway. Thank you, and uh, good morning to us all. I uh, would also like to echo what has already been said and thank the Secretariat and, of course, the working group for uh, uh, well done work. And uh, it's very comprehensive, as Sergei showed us on, on the picture. There's a lot of cogs to be working together. <laughs> so that's, that takes really, uh, that's really a challenge. But still, it's, it's, a, it's a good framework for uh, priorities and, uh, you know, uh, what should be prioritized also among the parties. And as was said by others, uh, it will not happen unless we, we find the resources uh, to actually perform. So, so it's like a, a small goals board. It's, uh, some, there is a list of things that we, uh, we could select among uh, as parties. In that sense, it, it is really uh, ambitious and... Uh, Maybe uh, you could say that it's dubious if we actually will be uh, able to, to comply and um, complete. Uh, I wanted to ask Sergei uh, uh, about the uh, national report, you know, of the coming uh, trienniums. Uh, of course, there is a link between uh, this uh, strategy uh, and the national reports because we have a lot of indicators and you want to see how the parties are performing. So uh, I guess then, uh, did you do a revision of the national report or is it, uh, how is that going? And uh, because you need to collect the data. I, I know you, you know about it, but you didn't mention it in your speech. So that, that's just a question, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the comments and the reflections and there are one or two questions that Sergei will, will take us through. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Norway, for the question. Actually, leads me to the next introduction I was going to make. I don't have a PowerPoint for that. It's a very short introduction of the document which contains the draft national report format for the period 2018-2020. So very briefly to introduce that, it addresses your question indeed. This format has been revised alongside the new or the draft strategic plan for the next period. So it builds on the, on the format that has been used since 2012, since MOP5, which was the first cycle when we ran an online uh, reporting. Before MOP5, we had paper-based reporting. It was a completely different format. 
So over the last 10 years, we have developed and evolved this format that has been ultimately used to, to report to this meeting of the parties. On the basis of that one, we have produced the new one. It contains all the mandates from and obligations according to the agreement and its action plan, as well as the indicators of the new strategic plan. So the new format is going to inform the assessment of the implementation of the strategic plan, as we have done it in the previous cycles as well. Uh, there is one chapter which has not been developed so far, and uh, this is something that is work in progress. We have already started um, uh, initial work on that. This is the chapter on the status of native and non-native populations. Uh, for this uh, work, the technical committee will require a little bit more time and the assistance of the Waterbird Monitoring Partnership. And the intention is to compile that chapter in a way so that actually it aligns with the formats of the Article 12 reporting under the BIRDS Directive, which will allow using the data uh, that will be provided by the member states of the EU in the reporting to Article 12 so that they do not report twice to different frameworks the same data sets. Uh, this is just for, uh, uh, for the purpose of efficiency. And actually we know that the data collected un under Article 12 perfectly feed, uh, fit the needs also under AWA for assessing the population status. So we expect to have that um, worked out in the next few months and uh, agreed by the technical committee and then passed on to the standing committee for, for approval so that it can be launched uh, um, by mid next year. Um, I hope that addresses your question and actually that's as much as I would like to introduce on this document. Uh, one thing I would like to say is that we have heard those parties that had comments on uh, the last reporting cycle. Many of those comments uh, relate actually to the architecture of the online template, not so much about the, uh, the data fields in what you see in this document, because it takes an additional step to translate what you see in the Word document into an online template. So we'll address those concerns and issues to make it more user-friendly for the future. Uh, but we, we don't believe that there is a need to actually modify the document which is before you here for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, CSJ. We'll now move on to the next item, the item agenda 16. Um, Evelyn Moloko will be taking us through that from Secretariat. It's looking at the plan of action for Africa. 2019 to 2027. The reference document is document 7.16. Um, just to inform delegates that uh, uh, there is a planned maintenance on the national grid, a power grid. Uh, the different areas are allocated uh, specific times, maximum two hours. Um, it could be less. So it probably would happen once, uh, not every day. I think it, for Deben it was for three days. I don't know whether it will still happen tomorrow, but it takes uh, 30 seconds for us to switch into the backup system. So that's why we were not panicking. We knew that within 30 seconds we'll be back online. So just uh, don't be surprised. We hope it won't happen again today, maybe tomorrow at any particular time. Evelyn, you will take us through the, the plan of action for Africa 2019 to 2027. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, the plan of action for Africa, as we all know, is a guide to implementing the AWA strategic plan in the African region. And in this sense, it's been based on the AWA strategic plan using the same structure and approach to develop action specific and tailor-made for the African region. This slide just gives an update on where do we come from, what mandate was given to the 
um, to the to AWA to develop the plan of action for Africa. Resolution 4.9 mandated the initial plan, which went from 2012 to 17, and was adopted uh, by Resolution 5.9, and Resolution 6.14 extended it to 2018 because the so that it could be adopted by the mob, given the mob cycles. Um, the AWA plan of action for Africa, similarly to the strategic plan, was developed in the framework of the plan of action working group, and we already looked at this yesterday, so I would not go into details about the composition of the group. I explained that in detail in my presentation yesterday. Um, it was within a one-year period, the core work was done on this by the working group um, um, uh, with the support of the consultants and the AWA secretariat. The structure, like I mentioned, uh, basically follows the strategic plan structure. So the goals of the strategic plan remain the same, of course. All the parts highlighted in blue are directly extracted from the strategic plan, but we try to make the, the strategic plan actions more concise and shorter so that we could, at a glance, quickly grasp what are we talking about without cramping the plan of action. A call from the parties was also to make it more user-friendly compared to the previous plan so that it could be, uh, at a glance, give a, uh, a, a quick uh, a clue to the parties what are the actions from the parties, who should be doing what, and we try to capture that in the sense that um, there's, a, there's a color coding which is very easy to use and facilitates the use by the parties, but also for donors and other target groups who are involved in implementing the plan. So the, the actions are on, on, on this end, and um, it, we, we give a time frame, of course, but we also prioritize um, the actions um, where we see the stars from essential to High, uh, high or medium priority without putting low because there's no low priority basically because everything is, uh, needs to be implemented. And uh, co uh, contrary to the previous plan where we assigned a an actual budget, we try to avoid that here by using um, estimates like budget symbols to show um, from a, a range of budgets like one the, the euro sign would be a, a, thousand, a thousand euros up to two, three euro signs and onward because uh, the actual budget would depend on the, on the country, would, re, would vary from country to country, and would vary from activity to activity, and would, there are lots of things influencing the budget. So it, rather than give an estimated or inflated impression of the budget, it would depend on the actual implementation, what would be done, and the budgeted work plans would be developed eventually by the parties, by the secretariat, and by partners involved in implementation. This is just giving an overview um, of the, some key elements um, which we have pulled out. Every single objective develops action, uh, under every single objective, actions are developed for the African region based on what are the needs to, to, for, for the region to be able to implement or to, uh, to attain the targets of the strategic plan. And one of the key uh, things we highlighted I highlight here is the collaboration, especially at the national level, with the different um, institutions which would be involved. So it's not just the AY implementing agency that would sit alone, but we call at, for, under every single object, objective for action with the different institutions. For example, the agricultural, forestry, uh, sorry, not for agricultural, um, and other ministries in, which would be involved in implementation, uh, because this cannot be done as a standalone um, plan. Uh, I also highlighted the legal issues which are crucial as Sega already mentioned, for comp to ensure that we are complying or the parties are complying with the AWA obligations. And there are very strict or uh, rigorous deadlines in this regard. And in order to comply, the parties have to look at these aspects and we highlight it in red as a crucial part of the plan of action. And we have um, um, uh, actions specific in this regard of, or, um, within, within a rather restricted time frame and parties should really pay attention to this. Um, uh, under sustainable management, for example, adaptive harvest management was one um, aspect that was considered as not the highest priority for the African region, given that, for example, uh, collecting harvest data is uh, of more crucial importance at this point, given where the region is with regard to um, harvest management. And in this case, we only suggest, for example, par a pioneering action on uh, maybe one pilot uh, case of uh, adaptive harvest management if um, identified as needed. Um, I don't know why, it's okay. It's 
late on that screen, just an example to show that the actions, just like the strategic plan, gives a logical order of actions. The plan of action follows this logical um, flow as well. Just an example, um, one of the actions I picked out, if by uh, it says by 2019, which is next year, parties should have um, uh, identified uh, am among their existing sites um, uh, or assess among existing sites, sites which are of crucial importance for migratory water birds. But by the same 2019, the, secretar the secretariat and partners should have uh, created, uh, disseminated a simple site re reviewing framework to support parties in this regard. And in this way, by um, MOP 8, the parties should have then further identified the gaps in, site, um, in the site uh, network. And by, in this, um, by so doing, by um, uh, for the strategic, uh, strategic plan activity, uh, 3.1a, by MOP 8 then, if the parties follow this um, series of logical framework of activities, they would have been able to achieve the uh, ac um, action required in the strategic plan, just to show that it also follows a logical framework, so that the, we, we are aware that the deadlines we indicate are really in the logical framework, and if you miss one, then the, high, the chances of delivering the strategic plan become very slim for the party. Uh, I already mentioned emphasis is put on uh, collaboration and collaboration at different levels at the national level but also at the international level where quite often we call on joint, developing joint project, uh, projects but the plan seems ambitious but it's also moderate and practical in the approach so rather than developing AWA projects we call on developing joint projects with other MEAs or with different structures at the national level who could be implicated in the implementation of the plan of action. We all, there's also a call at all levels for um, sharing information, this would also, which would definitely feed into decision-making processes, but also um, uh, increase visibility of the agreement. And um, I, here I, we also recall that the vital information to be provided by the parties would form the basis of everything on, uh, or effective implementation of the plan. So the parties are called upon to develop their national implementation plans and this would help them uh, implement it in a more effective manner. Uh, same like in the strategic plan, we will realize that the flyway approach, which is really the niche of AWA, is really further emphasizing the new generation of our strategic plan and plan of action for Africa. So this is a new element in the AWA plan of action where at the, uh, we, we identify for the major flyway groups, um, actions and activities which need to be implemented. The details are in the plan, so I will not go into the details here before I get, start getting being flagged. But we see that for the, diff for the four major flyway groups, we have specific actions that really address issues at, this, at the level of this flyway, and this was developed, and what are the ideas put together during the, the, the working group and further enhanced from the different cons consultation phases. Um, the, the meeting of the parties is called to review this document um, and hopefully eventually adopt the document. Um, in the framework of, the, of this same plan of action, I, we, uh, we would recall that the, uh, the, the uh, operative paragraph two to seven of the draft resolution one is calling on providing additional support for the AWA small grants funds, uh, calling on additional support, technical and uh, expert, uh, expert support, uh, similar to the one which is currently running from the government of France and Senegal for the different regions which have not yet, uh, re which are not receiving adequate support in this regard. And like I already mentioned, parties would be expected to um, develop their national implementation plans and there's a call for support for, uh, for supporting these parties who have developed national implementation plans in implementing these plans. Um, I've, uh, for the sub-regional technical focal point coordinators, I already mentioned there's a call for uh, updating the terms of reference um, in, in order to streamline this with the existing standing committee structure. And uh, there's also a call for uh, uh, developing a module in the framework of the national report module which would help, which would uh, permit reporting on the implementation of the plan of action, which was not also uh, the case in the past because the national report was automatically being used to report on the plan of action at the level of the parties. Um, this is it and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
will now open the floor for comments. Um, Egypt, followed by Estonia, Egypt. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Evelyn, for the presentation. Uh, I'd like firstly to congratulate, congratulate you and the Secretariat for developing the strategic plan and the plan of action for Africa as well. Uh, uh, they are both very well constructed. They are especially, uh, let's focus now on the uh, plan of action of Africa. It's, it's very well constructed. It's easy to digest, although it is very comprehensive and very detailed. And uh, actually this might lead to some complexity and some confusion for some of us. Actually, this is based upon my uh, uh, discussions uh, with some of my colleagues. Uh, there are numerous, the, the targets and objectives are numerous. Sometimes they, they show some uh, overlapping. Uh, so I think my suggestion is, is, if, is if we can uh, agree on a mechanism to simplify the, simplify the action plan, uh, like for instance, like to have a, a set of priorities for each triennium, this would be helpful to, 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 to make it uh, simplify, uh, simplified uh, and to turn it into actions. I think it's, it, 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 will, it will be helpful as well. So uh, I, th I think also uh, the reason why uh, I, uh, I say that uh, or, or, or most of these comments are related basically to the strategic plan uh, of Iowa, which is, as uh, my colleagues uh, has mentioned, very comprehensive and very detailed. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Egypt, Estonia. Thank you, Chair. So the EU and its uh, member states also very much uh, welcome the development on the new plan of uh, Africa, action for Africa, uh, further to the recognition that uh, additional efforts were needed for the implementation of the agreement in Africa. And uh, we also uh, feel, uh, as the previous speaker, that the prioritization of actions within this uh, plan would help to enhance the effectiveness and uh, guide contracting parties uh, in any considerations of uh, supporting these actions. Thank you. Evelyn. Thank you very much for the comments. Um, in response to Egypt, I would just, I mean, I would not want to go into any details at this point because this will be further uh, discussed in the working, technical working group. Um, the, the idea of um, having a separate document with, with higher priorities, I think this is more or less covered in the prioritization where you can quickly pick what, is the high, what are the highest priorities for the region. It might be the highest priority overall for the region, but for certain countries might not be. So when you develop your national implementation plans, this would become more clearer because it would not be one person sitting on the plan, but a group of experts at the national level assessing the plan and picking out what is relevant for the country and further prioritizing based on the country's needs is what we are hoping each country would do. And in, a, in addition, um, the idea was also to make sure that, to facilitate things for the parties. If we have this plan and another document which you look at separately, then it becomes, I think, more confusing for a party to have two documents. Just like if you had to use a strategic plan alongside this plan, it would have been more complicated with switching between documents. So we try to make it comprehensive but concise where you can take this along as your um, guideline for implementing the strategic plan without having to go back all the time to the same to the previous document to refer uh, while um, when using this document and also the the, the logical order of the uh, for each activity if, if you try to pull this out in a separate document I think it we, we tried to look at this to address this um, with, the, with the drafting team and it was it breaks the flow because for each activity there's a logical flow and it flows on to the next activities and even links between objectives. So we try to capture this by referring each time to activities which are linked in other objectives in the document so that when you're implementing one action, then you know it's linked to the other and you would immediately go there to look at where, what is linked to facilitate that as much as possible. And this can still be further facilitated where there's room for it. Of course, we are open to further facilitating things for the parties. We will be open to looking into this in detail again. Thank you very much. Uh, we will take the last uh, party on to take the floor, South Africa. 
Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Evelyn for the comprehensive presentation. I think the comment for the action plan for Africa is the same as for the strat plan of having an ambitious, very look at, lucrative and a well put together plan, but it has to be linked to the discussions on the other side on, on budgets and also a request for those who are in a position to do so to make sure that there are adequate and timely resources for implementation. Otherwise, its ambitiousness will be lost if we don't have resources that are attached to its implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn, for, for that. I think we'll also take further issues as part of the working group, as you indicated. We will request uh, CJ to take us through the draft resolution uh, on these items. Uh, draft resolution 7.1. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, this is quite a comprehensive resolution and it has packed a lot of decisions actually. Uh, I assume that you have all read it carefully and uh, you have your positions already on that. Uh, and because we're quite behind schedule now, I would uh, try to quickly run you through the content of this resolution. So first of all, what are the, uh, the, in the preamble part, there is some background information and mandates. Uh, this refers to resolutions 4.7, 4, uh, 5.9, and 6.14 uh, for the adoption of the past strategic plan and its extension, and the mandate for the development of the new one. Uh, also, the, uh, the mandate for the establishment of African sub-regional focal points contained in 5.9. Uh, it expresses appreciation to parties and other MEAs and organizations for contributing to the uh, implementation of uh, the current strategic plan and acknowledges the input of all parties and partners and the support provided to this development. It also refers to Resolution 1.7, through which the meeting of the parties established the Small Grants Fund, which is the only dedicated financial mechanism under the treaty to support eligible parties to implement the agreement. It notes that over the period between 2010 and 2015, the SG, SGF has disbursed just over 285,000 euros for 18 projects in 17 parties in Africa. Further notes, however, that since 2016, the SGF has been uh, post, and it could be only resumed if there are regular and substantial contributions to maintain this fund. Uh, it takes note of the conclusions of the strategic plan implementation report, as we have already uh, seen it yesterday. Uh, it notes also the findings of the seventh edition of the conservation status report, which was eloquently presented yesterday by Shabosh underlines the need to align with the SDGs, the ICHI targets, the strategic plan uh, for, management, uh, for migratory species and the Ramsar strategic plan. And uh, notes that the good governance is the most important determinant of population trends, as we have already heard that uh, from previous reports. Points at the dependency of the strategic plan and the plan of action for Africa uh, the monitoring of the implementation of those two processes uh, on a timely and comprehensive party reporting, as we already discussed that earlier. So going quickly through the operative part of the resolution, <clears throat> through the first paragraph, uh, it suggested to adopt the strategic plan and the plan of action for Africa as they're presented in the documents. Operative paragraph two urges all parties to allocate the finances and the resources for the implementation, more, more specifically the systematic and punctual implementation of these documents. Urges all parties to produce annual or triennial work plans as appropriate. Uh, not only parties, but the secretariat and all other stakeholders that are involved in the implementation of, the, of, of, of those plans. Calls also on parties to allocate additional resources uh, to the core budget in order to increase the capacity to coordinate and implement this plan, both plans, excuse me. 
strongly urges also supplementation of the SGF so that at least 50,000 euros can be dispersed to, to eligible parties in Africa and Eurasia, because so far the SGF has functioned only in Africa, but the aspiration is actually to broaden its operations beyond through, through, throughout the entire agreement area. Operative paragraph six calls uh, on donors other than parties to support the implementation of the strategic plan. Operative paragraph seven calls for the establishment of additional technical arrangements similar to those which France and Senegal has provided in the past and are still providing uh, to the plan of action for Africa, which is called technical support unit to the POA. An operative paragraph eight requests the standing committee, technical committee and secretariat to monitor the implementation of the strategic plan in the POA and report to each session of the meeting of the parties as it has been done so far. In the next operative paragraph, uh, it's suggested to approve the revised terms of reference for the sub-region of focal points, uh, focal point coordinators for the plan of action for Africa. It's annexed to the resolution. In the following one, uh, through the following one, you are uh, adopting the national reporting format for 2018-2020, only for this reporting period. Uh, not for the whole nine-year period. There will be revisions at the next meeting of the parties. Then the next one instructs the standing and technical committees and the secretariats to establish a reporting module on the plan of action for Africa, as it was already mentioned by Evelyn, and instructs the, gov the governing bodies, uh, the subsidiary governing bodies, to revise, amend, and enhance the national reporting format after each mo uh, a session of the meeting of the parties to align it with the latest decision. In the following one, there is a decision on the submission deadlines uh, on various reporting uh, items. The national report deadline is set at 180 days before the eighth meeting of the parties. The module on status of native and non-native species, which I already said it's being developed now, is set at 30th of June 2020. The purpose of that earlier reporting deadline is to make use of this data set for the eighth edition of the conservation status report, together with the Article 12 data. And the last reporting, psych, uh, reporting deadline is about the model on the Plan of Action for Africa, which is set at 240 days before more eight. Next paragraph urges parties to submit their reports in a timely manner and to provide complete and thorough reports. It's extremely important for the monitoring of implementation. And it instructs the Secretariat, UN Environment, and other MEAs to harmonize the strategic plan and the plan of action for Africa implementation with the other global framework, such as the SDGs, Aichi, Strategic Plan for Migratory Species, and Ramsar Strategic Plan. So your meeting is invited to review this draft resolution and adopt it for further implementation. Thank you, Chair. Okay, that's <clears throat> draft resolution 7.1. Um, any principal reflections? Noting that uh, this is also going to form part of the, the working groups. Oh, yes. Uh, Israel? Yes, thank you. Just, uh, first of all, a commendation to the uh, Secretariat for, and the Technical Committee for preparing the ac uh, action plan. We just, um, uh, presumably this will come up in the working group, but uh, in, in operative paragraph 15, we would like to see some language in there addressed to the um, post-2020 uh, framework which is being developed. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to word it, but we would like to see more liaison um, with the national focal points, um, especially uh, those who are focal points for the CBD, and to follow and keep track of the post-2020 process, and perhaps there is some way to incorporate it into the action plan. I realize, like we just mentioned yesterday, that these processes sometimes overlap in terms of the dates. But um, it might be useful to have language in there that at the next uh, MOP, 
um, there would be a chance to revisit the action plan to make any small amendments necessary uh, in light of the post-2020 framework, which by then will have been put into place by the uh, uh, CBD. So um, uh, we would just like to see some sort of language there, probably in operative paragraph 15, which we can discuss in the working group. Thank you. Okay, say Jim. Um, you've noted that. Thank you. Um, without any one asking for the floor from any of the parties, um, we'll now be moving to the next item, which is agenda item number 18. Agenda item number 18 will deal with the proposals for the amendments to the agreement and or its annexes. Um, parties are invited to uh, take document 7.19 and then this will also be followed by draft resolution which is uh, contained in draft resolution 7.3 so Sergey will be taking us through through that uh, specific item thank you thank you chair I'll do them in one presentation uh, which I can hopefully keep short so just a brief reminder about the uh, amendments to the AWA text and annexes. This is defined, the procedure is defined in Article 10 of the agreement. Any party can submit a proposal to any session of the meeting of the parties, and it's only a party that can do that. And to this session of the parties, there have been <clears throat> two parties submitting proposals by the deadline, which was set at 7th of July 2018 and no comments have been submitted by anyone after the circulation of those proposals by the Secretariat. The deadline for those comments was the 5th of October. Therefore, you don't have comments in your document back. So what are the proposals submitted? We have from Uganda on Annex 3, more specifically Table 1, uh, dated 20th of June 2018, and the European Union Annexes 2 and 3, including Table 1, dated 6th of July 2018. The content of the proposal of Uganda is reclassification of the populations on Table 1 resulting from the conservation status report. 7, it's circa 120 amendments which are suggested by the technical committee and also an amendment to Table 1 key of classification also suggested by the Technical Committee, and there is actually a document on this. It's AWA slash MOP 7.20, which will be presented shortly in another agenda item. So this proposal of Uganda is actually a formal submission of uh, uh, proposals resulting from the, work, from the work of the Technical Committee over the last triennium. The proposals uh, for the reclassification concern categories A3C and B2C, where there is a change in terminology from significant long-term decline to long-term decline and establishes, suggests establishment of, a, of two new categories, A3E and B2E, based on short-term decline. The proposal of the European Union is, the first one is to add a new species to Annex 2, and this is the European shack. The, sec, uh, the second uh, part of the proposal relates to Annex 3, adding two populations of the European shark on the, on the uh, table one. One is subspecies Desmaresti in the East Mediterranean under category A1C, and the second one is subspecies Aristoteles, uh, breeding population in the Barents Sea in category A2. As well as to reclassify to column A the populations of three species following the, the uh, recent uh, red list status upgrade to globally threatened or near threatened. These are the red knots proposed to category A4, Atlantic puffin to category A1B, and razor bill category A4. It should be noted that there is an overlap between this proposal and the proposal of Uganda. They're actually identical, and the proposal of Uganda is much broader. It concerns the entire table one. Going briefly to resolution point, uh, um, uh, draft resolution three, in the preambular part, it recalls uh, Article 
10, which defines the procedure, takes into account the finding of the seventh edition of the conservation status report, recognizes the work of the technical committee to review the definition of a term used in the context of Table 1, more specifically the long-term decline, and suggesting new listing categories, acknowledges the proposals of Uganda and the European Union, and in the operative paragraphs, 1 to 4 suggest adoption of the proposed amendments to Annexes 2 and 3, and Para 5 requests the Secretariat and the Depository to incorporate those amendments and disseminate updated English and French versions of the legal text, and if resources permit, also of the other two official languages of the treaty, which are Arabic and Russian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, any request for the floor? Okay, EU. Um, I've recognized EU. Any other party? Uh, in Denmark. Um, I see Norway as well. Okay, EU. Good morning. Uh, the European Union and its member states support the pros proposed amendments to the table, to the part of the table of Annex 3 relating to the criteria to apply when classifying populations of water birds, namely removal of the word significant from the criterion, significant long-term decline, and addition of the two new criteria for rapid short-term decline. The European Union and its member states approve the proposed changes to the status of species as proposed in Annex 1 of the draft Resolution 7.3. <laughs> However, among the species concerned by a population status change in Table 1 of Annex 3 of AWA, nine species, the common eider, the red-breasted merganser, the common potchard, the Eurasian oyster catcher, the northern lapwing, the bar-tailed godwit, the black-tailed godwit, the red knot, and the spotted red shank are currently huntable under the birds directive, the EU birds directive. For these nine species, the proposed changes would require a legal amendment of the birds directive. And unfortunately, it is not possible to amend the birds directive within 90 days of the date of adoption of the amendments of the meeting of the parties. So the European Commission shall enter a reservation in relation to the proposed amendments concerning these nine species. Despite this reservation, the European Union and the Commission in this context will ask the member states of the EU to respect the objective of not hunting the concerned species that it therefore would be in line with the new listing of AWA. Furthermore, for the populations of five of these species, the common eider, the Eurasian oyster catcher, the northern lapwing, the bar-tailed godwit and the red knot, listed in categories two, three and four of the column A of table one of AWA, for which parties will endeavor to implement the principles of adaptive harvest management consistent with the requirements of Article 7 of the Birds Directive in our case, the EU could lift its reservation with regard to them once an adaptive harvest management mechanism is in place. And of course, it goes without saying that the European Union and its member states would welcome the addition of the SHAG to Annex 2 on the basis of the proposal that we have made to the AWA Secretariat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, European Commission, EU, um, Denmark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. As this is the first time Denmark takes the floor, I would like to take the opportunity to express our gratitude to the government of South Africa for inviting us to this lovely city of Durban. 
under the agreement on the conservation of African Eurasian migratory water birds, Denmark has, in addition to its membership of the European Union, an independent role as the state responsible for the Faroe Islands. In this role, acting on behalf of the Faroe Islands and not as an EU member state, Denmark does not support the proposal by the European Union to amend Annex 2 by adding the European Shack. As a consequence, Denmark does not support the proposed listing of the non-EU, the Barents Sea population of the European Shack, in column A, category 2, in table 1 of Annex 3 of the agreement. Further, Denmark does not support the proposal by Uganda and the European Union to move all populations of Atlantic puffin to column A of table 1 of Annex 3, and Denmark does not support to move all populations of Razorbill to column A of table 1 of Annex 3. Denmark believes that hunting and taking of birds and eggs of the populations of Shack, Atlantic puffin, and Razorbill occurring in the Faroes should remain legal and not be subject to the regulation of the Agreement on the Conservation of African Eurasian Migratory Water Birds, as Denmark supports that the Faroes should take the relevant decisions regarding bird management at the Faroes on the basis of local interests and local traditions. The Faroes are monitoring and taking initiatives to secure a sustainable management of the local bird populations. Denmark will submit the statement in writing and would like to request the Secretariat to reflect it in the report of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denmark. Uh, Norway. Thank you. Uh, it's um, it's a comment we have on the on the proposal by the Commission on uh, on the European shag and uh, what they call the Barents Sea population. Um, I'd like to start off. There is a number of issues related to uh, to the to what I would call a draft uh, as circulated by the Commission. I would remind all parties, also the Commission, that it would be good if they do contact uh, relevant parties before it's posted on the web. In that case, we would be able to actually amend and correct what is set, it's stated in the proposal. One good example of that is they use the word bar and sea population. And they t took that, uh, well, maybe a geographical delimitation. They took it from a report which again reflects on our management uh, of the seas of the Northern Atlantic. It has nothing to do with seabird populations or delimitations at all. In Norway, the shag is distributed from the southern coast up all the way up to the Russian border. Our population, it's about 99.9% in Norway. There's a few hundred pairs on the Russian side. We don't call the North Sea Barents Sea, do we? No, we don't. Uh, we heard from Denmark, I don't know, maybe that, that's a misunderstanding, but as we see it, it is their intent to propose the Barents Sea, what they call the Barents Sea, which maybe should be the Northeast Atlantic or something like that. Because the species is distributed from Spain through France, Britain, Iceland, Norway, and this is the subspecies or the nominate form, Aristoteles, Aristoteles. We also note that uh, even BirdLife has got some things wrong when they state that populations on Iceland is, is a resident, doesn't migrate. Uh, population in the UK is resident, doesn't migrate. But for Norway, it, it migrates, which is contrary to our information. I also remind you that we have 100 years of monitoring of seabirds in Norway. We have a strong program for monitoring of seabirds. It's running on a daily basis. So we do know what we have. Another thing is it's also stating that it's, uh, it's been a drop in the population, which is untrue. It's normal. It's listed even by BirdLife, our national red list, as least concern. 
and we know what we have, as I said, because we do monitor them on a daily basis. So it's, it's, a, it's a mismatch, actually, of, uh, <coughs> which we could have amended. Uh, it's also, you know, in our convention, we're talking about migratory species. The question is, is this a migratory species? There is a few handful of ringing recoveries, I think about maybe 30 or so. Uh, you know, haphazard distribution going here and there along the coast, maybe once or twice crossing over to, to Shetland, coming back maybe. Is that migration? I'm not sure. So I think that we, we actually need to look into uh, the proposal more carefully. Maybe it should be dropped, if you ask us. And certainly, if, if it is to be listed, uh, it doesn't comply with our own criteria. It should be a totally different set of criteria, simply because the population is much higher. Uh, we, should also, we should also be careful about which geographical region or subspecies, uh, as I'm reflecting back on what Denmark said. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's also uh, huntable in, in Norway because the population is above the threshold for species that could be hunted. And so therefore we could not accept uh, any listing on column A. And, as I said, it, it doesn't comply, actually, with, uh, with the numbers. Uh, the total population in, in Western Europe, uh, this subspecies or nominate form, is about from 75 to 85,000 uh, pairs. And that is well beyond uh, the threshold of 100,000 individuals. So, so there's another issue. But it all depends on, on which population you're looking at. So I think my suggestion is that we actually have a bilateral uh, secretariat, maybe the proponent, and uh, we'll see where we are, if this is actually a, a proposal that we need to, to follow on. Thank you. Okay. Um, Iceland, thank you very much, Norway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Iceland uh, supports the statements made by Denmark and also by Norway on the number of changes uh, on, annex, on the annexes uh, relating to the, the shark, the puffin, the racer bill, and uh, we'd also like to add some information on the pink-footed goose. Um, we uh, have to question the, the proposal made by the EU to change the listing of uh, the three species, the shack, the puffin, and the razor bill, um, basically on, on uh, the number of uh, pairs and, and then uh, the conservation state in, status in Iceland. Um, and uh, we would uh, certainly have to make a reservation to those species if they will be um, listed in different categories in the annex. Um, all these species are uh, species that are hunted in, in Iceland, and uh, as a matter of fact, they are not only hunted by hunters, they are subject to traditional use in our legis legislation and um, that part of the Icelandic legislation is not uh, something that uh, the Ministry for the Environment and Natural Resources can uh, have any effect on. It's uh, only the Parliament. It's uh, subject to parliament parliamentary decision to do that, so we would, uh, if those species will be uh, transferred and uh, be uh, subject to no hunting, we would have to take that to the parliament uh, and uh, the outcome of the parliamentary discussions will be um, difficult to predict, so um, 
um, we look forward to the possibility to discuss this issue further in the, in the working group. Um, and uh, regarding the pink-footed goose, um, as Norway indicated, uh, the numbers uh, for some of these uh, species that are subject to changes now, um, there are um, an insufficient and basically, in our understanding, uh, not correct information regarding the population size in uh, some cases, and that certainly refers to the pink-footed goose. So we would have to uh, uh, make some uh, changes or take a discussion on that estimate in the working group too, and uh, possibly make a reservation regarding that species too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Sergei. Any reflections? Um, thank you very much for your comments um, on this very important item. Um, we are now going to take uh, a short break, tea break, it's half past ten. Um, if we can make it back here in 15 minutes so that we, we could start at uh, 10.45. Um, in the next session of uh, agenda items will start with the <coughs> focus on um, action plans and also management plans. Um, we didn't want to start and, and just leave them uh, halfway through. That's why we're taking a short break now. 10.45, we come back and we continue. Thank you.
Carton Luto from there? Oh, okay. Manje. Uh, Pedagogy, we finally have a condensed Manje, <laughs> Manje, when the Ranja and we is on a lap, we receive. We receive a corner receiver. You receive it clean, So, 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 this is a receiver straight. Yeah, in the Sunday, I'm telling you, I'm Kuluma, I'm Kuluma, I'm Nandin. Sanga Kuluma, we are transient. This will be your, your signal getting uh, channel 1. Uh, it should be clean, clean, clean from the booth. How is it sounding? No, it's clean. Yeah.
One, two, yeah, yeah, one, two.
One, two. One, one, two. One, two. Test one, two. Test one, two. Thank you. Um, we'll continue with our meeting. Thank you very much. Um, we are now moving to agenda item 19. There's a series of uh, areas that we'll be focusing on as part of agenda item 19. Um, this agenda item deals with uh, species actions and also management plans. Um, Nina will take us through the first one, which uh, focuses on current status. Um, you are referred to document 7.21, 7.21, um, and then she will take us through. Nina. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, yes, so this, uh, I'm briefly going to go through the main outcomes of this, uh, this document on the current status of species action and management plan production and coordination under the agreement, including recommendations to the meeting of the parties for extension, revision, or retirement of action plans. So the current status of preparation of uh, action and management plans under the agreement is that we have a total of 24 single species action plans already adopted, one international multi-species action plan, and one management plan. And this meeting is uh, expected to adopt another two new action plans, one revised action plan, and two new management plans. So as we all know, international coordination plays a key role in the successful implementation of these plans, and that's why the Secretariat in particular has uh, put a key focus of our work into trying to establish international coordination for the adopted plans. And of the 23 action and management plans, which um, are valid for implementation, um, 14 have AY International Species Working or Expert Groups at the moment. So we have nine plans that are without any form of active international coordination under AWA. And we foresee coordination for all four new plans to be adopted at MOP7, and uh, we are already making arrangements for those. And uh, just wanted to note at this stage that no coordination mechanisms exist for the three action plans suggested for retirement. I'll come to those in a minute. So you'll remember that at the last uh, MOP, uh, a procedure was adopted for the revision and possible retirement of action plans. And um, during the de deliberation processes in the technical committee, um, the need arose actually for a third option in this process, uh, which is to extend the validity of action plans in their original adopted form. Now, many of the plans that we have uh, remain completely valid in terms of their threat assessment and overall objectives and goals. And rather than spending our resources and time, which are limited, as we all know, uh, on an extensive revision, those resources could rather be focused on the implementation of the plans. Um, and extensions would, in general, be issued for 10 years as a general rule, with, of course, the possibility of exceptions and also emergency reviews that applies to all of our plans. And um, including this option requires a slight amendment of the procedure that was adopted at the last MOP. This figure here has just slightly been amended to include the option to also extend action plans in their current form. And this is included as an annex um, to the resolution itself, and it's also in the document. So coming to the TC recommendations for extension, revision, or retirement of action plans, the technical committee uh, is recommending that the parties decide to extend the following plans until 2028, so for 10 years. Those are for great snipe, ferruginous duck, lesser white-fronted goose, lesser flamingo, Eurasian spoonbill, black-tailed gawit, makoa duck, white-winged fluff-tail, and Madagascar pond heron. Okay. I lost my screen in front. I hope you can still see something. Okay. Um, and to revise the action plan for the white-headed duck, which we've already done. That's, uh, I'll come to that in the next presentation, or the one after that. Um, and the technical committee is uh, recommending that the action plans for corn crake, light-bellied Brent goose, and black wind Pratt and Cole be retired. Overall, we urgently need measures to increase uh, action plan implementation, and um, some of these extended action plans could benefit from a shorter conservation brief, highlighting any new scientific information and or threats. Um, and this could particularly be useful for plans with no international coordination mechanism, so no working group, um, or where the established mechanism hasn't been active to date. And uh, establishing or reactivating these international coordination mechanisms, so either AY International Species Working or expert groups for these extended action plans should ur urgently be considered. So what we're requesting from the meeting of the parties is to take note of the current status of action and management plan preparation and coordination and uh, following the recommendations of the technical committee, uh, the parties are further requested to review and approve the revised process for the retirement of action plans to include the option of extension, as well as to review and approve the re recommended treatment of the selected action plans that I listed a, a few slides ago. And um, 
as we just decided that I'm not, we're not presenting any resolutions anymore due to uh, time constraints, uh, I'd just like you to note that uh, all of the action plan and management plan related decisions are in uh, draft resolution five. Okay, thank you very much. Draft resolution 7.5 um, for any reference to, to resolutions. Any party that would wish to take the floor? Estonia. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. The EU and its member states uh, recognize the work done by Technical Committee uh, on the re revision of uh, the criteria for the prioritization of species populations for uh, action and management plans and uh, monitoring of uh, ISAP uh, and to present uh, proposals for their revision uh, or retirement. We uh, can agree that uh, the retiring uh, of ISAPs uh, for light-bellied uh, uh, brown goose and black-winged uh, trading coal and uh, extension of uh, the ISAPs for uh, another 10 years uh, for Great Snipe, uh, Fregunistak, uh, Lesser Flamingo, Eurasian Spoonbill, Black-tailed Codwit, uh, Makoa Duck, White-winged uh, Fluff-tail and uh, Madagascar uh, Pond Huron. Uh, the EU and its member states uh, propose to extend the uh, validity of the ISAP for the corn crake, uh, initially for the next three years until MOP8, to enable parties to review and amend uh, where necessary the existing, uh, ex existing plan, uh, considering uh, population trends and uh, to seek a coordination uh, to drive any further extension and uh, delivery to uh, to the ISA. Um, we propose to extend the validity of the ISAP uh, for the lesser white fronted coos uh, for the next three years until MOP8 to revise the action plan taking into account uh, new scientific information, for example, uh, regarding the Swedish population as well as experiences for, from implementation uh, of the current plan. And the EU and its member states think that uh, any new mechanism to prepare the plan uh, needs to fully address the protection of the species under the BIRDS Directive, and uh, an appropriate mechanism to assure this needs to be put in place. And we have also uh, some technical comments to draft Resolution 5, and uh, we will uh, send our uh, comments in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Estonia, on behalf of the EU. Um, we will now move on to the next item, um, which uh, focuses on the draft revised format and guidelines on the Iowa International Single and Multi-Species Action Plans. A reference is made to document 7.22. Uh, Nina will take us through this one. Okay, so the next one. Um, the draft revised format and guidelines for AWA international single and multi-species action plans. So at, uh, again, the last meeting of the parties, MOP6, um, discussions about action planning under the agreement, and um, MOP6 highlighted the need to make AWA action plans more streamlined, implementable, accessible, and practical particularly for policymakers who are ex expected to implement these plans um, back home. And uh, so as requested in Resolution 6.8, the Technical Committee undertook a revision of the format during this last uh, triennium. Uh, this was facilitated by uh, Wetlands International in particular and the AWA Secretariat. Um, and actually the new and revised action plans that are submitted to this meeting for adoption, they already follow this new format because the Standing Committee um, adopted uh, the format on a temporary basis, so the new plans also already follow, follow the new format. Um, and just as a note, the initial idea was that we would have one, a one format fits all plans, but uh, during the action and management planning processes that were run during this triennium, it was just realized that obviously our experience with regard to species recovery plans is much, much greater, and um, it was thought the technical committee thought it decided to have just one format for the single and multi-species action plans and a separate format for the management plans will be developed by the technical committee during the next triennium. 
So the current revision builds on the uh, 2008 uh, format prepared by BirdLife. Um, it's shorter, it's to the point, and uh, hopefully much easier to use. And it c consists of two parts. So the first part is the format itself in section A, and in section B, there's a guidance on the facilitation of action planning processes under AWA, and also specific guidance on how to complete the format. So this is meant for the people who are compiling the plans themselves. And uh, we really hope that this revised format will uh, further strengthen the, ve the development of our plans and um, also assist in strengthening the implementation. Now, just to make a note here that obviously action planning under AWA very much remains an evolving process. And uh, as our experience grows, further changes to the format and guidance may be required in future, but the technical committee is uh, following this. So I'm not going to go through the whole structure, but I just wanted to point out that uh, the main changes, so those of you who are acquainted with the old format, is that you had to go through the whole document to find the threats and f particularly the actions in the back. So we've pulled all the, f the action framework has now been pulled to the front. Um, so you just have a one or two page basic data information when you open the plan, but then you really immediately come to see what, what needs to be done. And so the action requested from the, from the parties is to review the revised draft format and guidance and uh, to adopt it for further use. And this is also contained in DR5. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretariat. Uh, any requests for the floor? Estonia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the EU and its member states recognize the work done by the Wetlands International and reviewing the draft uh, revised format uh, of IWA, single and uh, multi-species action plans. We welcome the further uh, development of this document as a uh, necessary step to enhance the work on the migratory waterbird populations. And uh, we would propose adding a summary uh, of the main uh, threats and uh, pressures before uh, the framework of action uh, would provide a useful uh, explanation of uh, the need for the uh, concerned uh, plans. And uh, we have also uh, some additional comments that uh, we will uh, send in writing. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Estonia, for that. Um, we'll now move on to the next uh, agenda item, or still within the same category of actions and uh, um, management plans. This time around, we'll focus on the item uh, under REF documents, or the documents 7.23, 7.24, and 7.25, um, dealing with the three um, Iowa International Single Species Action Plans uh, that have been tabled for adoption. Nina? Yes, so continuing on the action plans, so um, at this uh, meeting of the parties, we have uh, three, three action plans that uh, are tabled for adoption. We have, uh, okay, I'm just checking that it's okay. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, two new plans for the Velvet Scoter and the Dalmatian Pelican and a revised uh, plan for the Whiteheaded Duck. And all three of these were developed under the EU um, Life Eurosat project coordinated by BirdLife International. Um, and as I just mentioned, they follow the revised AWA action plan format. And um, these have been obviously approved, submission to the MOP by the technical committee and the standing committee. And uh, these three plans have actually already been adopted by the EU uh, at uh, their NADIC meeting in May. And the Dalmatian Pelican and Whiteheaded Duck plans have already been adopted by the CMS standing committee in October 2018 for CMS. So the action plan for the velvet scoter covers the Western uh, Siberian and Northern European, Northwest European population. And the plan was compiled by BirdLife Lithuania uh, and WWT. Uh, and there was uh, an action planning workshop held in October 2016 in Lithuania with uh, additional funding for the process kindly provided by Germany. Um, and the legal frameworks adopting are the EU and AWA. And the implementation will be coordinated by the AWA Northern European Sea Duck International Working Group, 
um, which has a first meeting foreseen for the second half of 2019. So the next one is the action plan for the Dalmatian pelican, which covers all three global flyway populations. Um, the plan was compiled by the Society for the Protection of Prespa and BirdLife Greece, um, with an action planning workshop held in November 2016 in Greece. And uh, additional funding was kindly provided by Italy for this uh, process. Um, and here I'd like to mention that as part of the extensive consultations, um, we were uh, assisted by Wetlands International in particular in uh, gathering information for the East Asia flyway population. And the legal frameworks adopting are the EU, the, C the CMS, East Asian and Australasian Flyway Partnership. They have a meeting next week where this is on the agenda for adoption and AWA. Uh, and the Secretariat is in process of identifying a coordinating organization. And last but not least, the white-headed duck. So this is a revision of the first international action plan adopted in 2006, and it, again, is a global flyway uh, plan. Um, and the plan was compiled by BirdLife Spain, um, and uh, during the, the action planning was conducted during the first meeting of the, of the AWA working group for the species in October 2016 in Madrid. And here we had additional funding provided by Italy, Spain, and the MAVA Foundation. And the legal frameworks adopting are EU, CMS, and AWA. And the implementation, obviously, is coordinated by the AWA Whiteheaded Duck International Working Group. And the action requested from the, from the meeting of the parties is to review the draft action plans and adopt them for imp implementation also through DR5. Thank you very much. Uh, any request for the floor on these uh, three uh, international single species uh, action plans? I see uh, that Norway and then Estonia. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just a small comment, and uh, we do indeed uh, accept the proposals. But there is one on uh, the Velvet Scorter. Uh, one comment. Uh, I'd like to point out that in Table 4, page 23, uh, the last estimate of breeding populations uh, population is from 2015. And there seems to be an error in figure 2 on, on the problem tree, page 30, 32, uh, describing level of threats from 1 critical to 5 local. And it's not pointed out uh, in the figure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Estonia. Thank you. So the EU and its member states uh, also recognize the work done by this uh, uh, paper by the compilers of the ISAPs. And we welcome the adoption of the draft, draft uh, ISAP of uh, Wolbert Scholar, the draft revised ISAP uh, of White Headed Duck, and the uh, draft ISAP of uh, Tilmatian Pelican. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We'll now move on to the next one. Um, Eva from Iowa Secretariat will take us through the two Iowa International uh, Management Plans um, that are being or that have been tabled for adoption. Uh, reference is made to documents 7.26 and also 7.27. Um, Eva will take us through. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I will briefly walk you through the management plans for the barnacle goose and the gray lag goose together in this presentation. So according to the AWA fundamental principles and conservation measures, parties should take coordinated measures to maintain um, migratory waterbird species in a favorable conservation status or to restore them to such a status and also ensure that any use of migratory water birds is based on the assessment of best um, available knowledge and uh, is sustainable for the species. So um, according to the AY Action Plan and to Resolution 6.4, which was adopted at the last MOP, uh, the parties have been asked to cooperate in the development of single species management plans for species that also cause significant damage 
and a process to address the sustainable use of goose populations and to provide for the resolution of human goose conflict, targeting as a matter of priority the barnacle goose and the grey lag goose populations. The populations of these two species have increased in the past decades, yet their conservation status and legal status differs. For example, in the AOA Table 1, the Berne Convention and the EU Birds Directive. So more in the legal analysis is provided in Annex 4 of both of the management plans. The development of the Barnacle Goose Species Management Plan was planned for the three populations and it kicked off with a stakeholder workshop which took place in Copenhagen in June 2017. It was compiled by an international team of experts and coordinated by Aarhus University who are also um, currently coordinating the EGMP data center, as well as Rubicon Foundation, and funded kindly by the Danish Environmental Protection Agency and um, amongst other funders. So following this workshop, uh, another workshop took place with uh, stakeholders and range states um, to develop the Grey Lag Goose Management Plans. And here, as well as in the previous workshop, the um, draft biological assessment was presented and discussed, and also the views from all the stakeholders were collected to further develop the plans and the framework for action. This uh, workshop took place in Paris in October and was compiled by OMPO, ARS University again, and Rubicon Foundation under the um, coordination of the Secretariat as well. It was funded by the French Ministry and the Norwegian Environmental Protection Agency, amongst many other different funders, which I'm not going to list now. And so after these two workshops, another draft was compiled that has included all these views and the input that has been provided and circulated for another round of consultation. And based on that feedback, uh, another revised draft was uh, discussed and presented at a second international management planning workshop which took place in Leuven in the Netherlands in June this year. Both plans were discussed at this workshop and uh, stakeholders agreed on the following goals, which are the, the following goal, which is the same for both plans, to maintain the population in a favorable conservation status while taking into account ecological, economic and recreational interests. Both plans also include six fundamental objectives and um, for the Grey Lag Goose Plan, there's one additional fundamental objective. In the implementation phase of these plans, um, it is foreseen to develop adaptive flyaway management programs. In the case of the Barnacle Goose, these flyaway management programs will be developed specifically for each of the populations, and they will include um, if necessary, the development and definition of management units, favorable reference values, uh, work plan, and so on. In case of the Grey Lag Goose, Northwest Southwest European population, um, at the last workshop, man provisional preliminary management units have been agreed to be used. And for each of these management units, again, specific adaptive flower management programs will be developed in the implementation phase. So both plans have gone through an extensive consultation carried out with government representatives of all the range states as well as key experts in each of the countries. The plans have also been reviewed by the technical committee in April this year. This was the second draft at that stage and approved for submission and also the standing committee who had a third draft uh, which was also approved subject to the finalization after the second stakeholder workshop. So following that workshop in uh, June, a fourth draft was created, which was also circulated for consultation. And the current final draft that you have has been approved through written procedure by the technical committee and the standing committee in October. So this meeting is requested to uh, review these draft management plans and adopt them for further implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, any request for the floor? Uh, Estonia? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
The EU and its member states uh, recognize the work done by the compilers, compilers of the uh, IS, uh, ISMPs. Uh, we recognize the uh, progress uh, in the efforts uh, to de coordinate the management of the uh, grey lacus uh, population at the flyby level uh, when relevant, and the measures aimed at uh, preventing damage or uh, managing uh, risks uh, in the context of the European Goose Management Platform. And the EU and its uh, member states agreed to support the adoption of the uh, ISMP uh, for the Grey Lake Goose. Uh, North and Southwest European population. Um, however, however uh, not all member states agreed to uh, the added uh, value and um, Therefore, uh, the ISMP will only be implemented by the member states that find it useful. So the EU would like to request uh, the Secretariat to reflect that situation in the minutes of the model. And um, as for the barnacle goose, uh, the EU and its member states um, appreciate that there have been major improvements uh, in the draft uh, SMP. Um, we would like to stress the need for some adaptation of the text uh, with the view uh, to the uh, adaptation of the plan. Uh, we suggest the following amendments to the plan. As regards uh, EU member states, uh, it needs to be clearly stated uh, in the uh, single species management plan that uh, when taking a derogation uh, decisions according to the article 9 of the birds directive a link between the risk of serious damage uh, not population management per se in this respect inter alia annex 3 on uh, projection of population size and harvest rates uh, needed to uh, stabilize the population should be amended accordingly the EU and its member states would uh, ask the IMF Secretariat to uh, explore with the concerned parties uh, ways to minimize the cost of running the European Goose Management Platform in order to provide uh, enough flexibility for further uh, developments. In it is suggested to state uh, in the uh, ISMP that uh, the proposed uh, adaptive flyway management program should uh, be adapted periodically instead of uh, annually. And uh, as regards uh, the European Goose Management pl Platform uh, budget, uh, the uh, ISMP should uh, properly reflect the voluntary character uh, of the contributions. And finally, uh, the ISMP for uh, barnacle goose is not a suitable instrument to address uh, putative risks to public health. Uh, thus, the uh, respective part of the objective should be deleted. Uh, as stated in the plan itself, uh, there is little evidence of transfer of diseases to humans uh, or to other wildlife, for that matter. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Estonia. Um, with all of this, uh, thank you very much, Eva. Oh, yes. Uh, is that no way? All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, as we heard from Nina, there's been quite a few circulations and quite a few years working on these plans. Uh, so when the EU now re reading out uh, some changes, it's a bit surprising to put it that way. Uh, especially if they are substantial and we need to look into the consequences of those changes and it should be discussed so it sounds almost like we are coming out for a fifth round of uh, circulation of, of those texts and besides uh, we couldn't get everything what they read out so it's a bit difficult to actually take a position so I, I would su suggest that we postpone the adaptation uh, adopting the, the plans so that we can look more carefully into the texts as suggested and to reveal whatever their uh, consequences will be. Uh, we also have a, an, a suggestion ourselves which is of a more general nature. Uh, we certainly do want to 
adopt both plans at this meeting. And we wish to add that uh, a text saying that there is a potential conflict to air safety, which also involves several small airports along the Norwegian coast. The Norwegian Air Safety Authorities wishes to underline that there is a future concern of increased risks of bird strike, especially from the migrating populations of geese along the coastline. So those are the, the addition on uh, air safety issues. But, uh, as I said, we need to look into the text or amendments as, as suggested. So I want to revert back to that. Also because I, I couldn't get what, uh, what was said, all of it. Thank you. Uh, Eva, we'll request you to give a brief response to this. Thank you. Yes, um, so we have received those comments um, provided by the EU in writing and incorporated them already into a revised version, which is uploaded as WGP1 on the meeting website. And um, you will be able to, hopefully if the Wi-Fi is working, look at it now straight away. And otherwise it will be up for discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are not going to go through the draft resolution uh, for all these items that we we went through, the items on species actions or species species action and management plans. But I will refer you to draft resolution table for adoption, which is document 7.5, um, as a reference to that. Uh, so the working groups will go through that in detail. We now move on to the next item or a series of items, uh, three meeting documents that we'll be looking at. They are all about uh, seabeds. Um, agenda item 20 on seabeds. Um, we'll start with the first document, which is document 7.28, 7.28, dealing with plastics and water beds. Um, Sergey will take us through that one. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the sake of time, I would like to go rather fast through this presentation. Uh, we hope that you have all managed to read through this report. Um, it's a very good piece of work, and it's uh, worth actually reading. There is, it's quite a technical document, but uh, it's very informative. And actually, um, it's the first attempt to um, look into the issue of plastics and Ava water birds. And the conclusions are very important for actually prioritizing uh, activities on this issue. Um, so in terms of the background, um, this was actually uh, recognized as an issue in resolution 6.9. And the technical committee was uh, requested to look into the issue. Uh, thanks to funding received from the government of the Netherlands, uh, the Secretariat managed to commission this work to RSPB and BirdLife International, and uh, they outsourced this uh, to um, an expert of, of theirs uh, from the University of Cape Town, Peter Ryan, who uh, produced this uh, incredibly comprehensive report, which actually is already also a peer-reviewed article published in a journal. Uh, this was reviewed by the Technical and Standing Committees and was uh, submitted, therefore, to your meeting. Uh, so I'll very quickly go through the substance of the report because uh, it's very detailed, so I'll just stop on a few key messages in, in each of those. Obviously, there is no need to introduce the issue of plastics to you. It's, a, it's a really uh, on top of the agenda nowadays, uh, particularly led by UN Environment. Um, so particularly pollution at sea is very is very complex issue to, to tackle. Uh, there are several ways through which water birds interact with plastics and ingestion has potentially uh, significant physical or chemical impacts. The other way of interaction is the entanglement, uh, which uh, is uh, happening with debris of uh, plastic origin. 
Uh, these are usually long uh, filaments uh, which are floating on the surface. Uh, and the third way of interaction is the use of plastic for nesting, for nest building, which also can lead to issues with entanglement in, um, in chicks, for example. Uh, so the ingestion, um, one way, one, one kind of impact is the physical impact, uh, and it can first lead to clogging of the digestive tract, and the second way is that it can reduce actually the volume of the stomach, uh, so the birds cannot feed sufficiently and actually can lead to, to mortality. Uh, so I'm not going in detail for the sake of time, as, uh, as I said. Uh, so as I already said, the digestive tract could, uh, if, it's, if it's clogged by plastic, can lead to mortality. Uh, the, the big loads of plastic can have actually e uh, impact on the, on the quantity of the diet. But uh, it, amongst the Ava water birds, there is little evidence of large loads of plastic in their stomachs. Uh, a number of species actually regurgitate, and uh, this also uh, leads to issues with identifying uh, to what extent they actually do swallow ingest plastic, uh, because it's not con the, the whole plastic that they, they ingest is not necessarily contained in the stomach that, uh, when they examined. Um, yeah, so the, the issue of those that regurgitate is mentioned here. But those, uh, actually the chicks are, uh, are most at risk here because they receive uh, food from both parents so they will be receiving actually bigger amounts of plastic than the adults. So what are the chemical impacts of, uh, of ingestion? Uh, first, it's the plastic itself, and then it's the persistent organic pollutants, which actually accumulate on top of floating plastic. So through these two uh, ways, um, plastic is impacting. Uh, there is need of additional information to what extent actually there is a, a transfer of pollutants from plastic to birds when it comes to, pollutant, uh, to persistent uh, organic pollutants. Uh, in terms of, of the plastic itself, uh, those, that, those species that will be most impacted are the ones that accumulate the plastic in their, in their stomachs because it takes some time for the plastic to to erode and then start releasing the chemical uh, content. So the next uh, issue is the entanglement. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a seldom actually uh, that um, significant number of the population suffers from this interaction with plastic. Probably the only uh, exception here is the northern gannet for, for which there is evidence of, of a larger part of the population suffering from, from this interaction with plastic. Uh, oaks are another group of birds that can actually suffer from entanglement and I listed you know, all the six species which are listed on, on, on AVA. Uh, most of the entanglement of course results from uh, interaction with fishing gear either nets or, or fishing lines. Um, and often it's difficult to say whether this is actually a bycatch or it's entanglement with, uh, with, with ghost fishing gear. Um, so the use of plastics for, uh, for, for building nests, um, this is regularly done by species such as gannets, cormorants, and, and gulls. Um, and it's variable among species to, to what extent, and uh, amongst regions, obviously. Certain regions are less polluted by plastic than others. Um, so the main items that actually are being used for nest building are ropes, uh, straps, and, and fishing lines. And uh, they, they actually pose, pose threats to adults and chicks in particular. And mortality has been identified from entanglement on nests uh, in northern gannet and, and bank cormorant and a few other water bird species. Um, 
So when we look actually across the AWA list as a whole, uh, it has been identified that 40% of 102 species uh, have been recorded to interact with waste plastic altogether. 22% of the species contain ingested plastic to a certain, to, to a lesser or, or greater extent. 31% of the AWA listed species have been observed to entangle in, in plastic debris, and 8% use plastic items to build their nests. Um, but this is underestimated because not all species uh, have been checked and sample sizes are rather modest. So uh, there is need of more data actually and uh, more, more, most that we know about these interactions comes from the seabirds rather than from other water birds. So there is need of more um, knowledge about these interactions amongst the freshwater species. Um, it has to be noted that few of the AUA listed species actually have high incidence of ingestion. Uh, the most impacted probably are the phalaropes. It has been identified that globally 46% of the phalaropes contain plastic in their digestive tracts. But other species also ingest, uh, such as doubling ducks, more than 40% of them, gulls, 15, skewers, 14, and oaks, 10%. Um, right, so in terms of entanglement, it's, as, it, as it was already mentioned, the northern gannet is the one probably that mostly suffer. The Cape gannet has a much lower rate of entanglement. Uh, that's possibly also because it occurs in a different part of, of the agreement area in the Benguela current where the, the pollution with plastic is, is much less than in the northern Atlantic. Uh, there is a number of other species uh, in addition to the northern garden such as the great cormorant and some gull species that frequently uh, entangle in the North Sea. Mute swan also has been recorded as, uh, as a victim. So in terms of, uh, of monitoring, uh, how this uh, should be done, this uh, should be done and primarily on, on, on dead birds, of course. Um, so species, uh, when they're being hunted, they could be examined, or birds which are found dead on, on the shores could also be examined and sampled. Uh, Yes, yeah, so there is need of a standard comparison protocol in order to be able to actually have systematic approach to the monitoring of, um, of interaction with the plastic. So I'm going very quickly through that. It's uh, very detailed and we don't have the time to go uh, through each of that. Uh, so the, the conclusion in terms of monitoring here is that it's uh, it's difficult to detect changes in entanglement over time. Uh, so there is need of long-term service. Uh, and another method that could be used, which was for me was quite interesting actually to, to understand that actually Googling and uh, searching the web for images of entangled birds could be a method to identify uh, rates of, of entanglement amongst birds. And uh, also there could be um, website repositories established for the public to submit images that they have taken uh, of birds in tangle. That could help actually to identify the scope of the issue. So a few conclusions and recommendations. Uh, so many AWA species uh, interact with plastic, but currently there is no evidence of population level impact of any of the kinds of interactions that have been uh, uh, it have been mentioned. Ingestion probably has the, great, the, great, the greatest potential for impact, but few AWA species accumulate lar large, plastic, uh, large lo loads of plastic in their stomachs. Um, so despite the, the increasing amount of plastic in the oceans, there is little evidence of increasing incidence of plastic ingestion. Um, amongst the, the AWA listed species. And more information, of course, 
is, is needed. Uh, and this is amongst the recommendations outlined by, by the author. So, despite the, the, the lack of evidence, it has to be underlined that all water birds species are uh, actually uh, at risk from entanglement, not only those for which it has been identified as, uh, as a particular uh, problematic issue, like the northern gannet. And uh, there is need of more focused mitigation measures to be put in place. Uh, such as banning high-risk applications, discouraging the use of uh, high-risk items, and encouraging users to discard plus, uh, particularly risky materials uh, appropriately. Um, right, so final, final item is that more data is needed on particularly on accidental entanglement and uh, bycatch, uh, as well as targeted captures of water birds. Um, and the, the data that has been used actually for this uh, report are rather biased geographically. They mainly come from Europe and South Africa. So whatever the conclusions are and the evidence is presented here, it's actually not conclusive for the agreement area. So the more we know, the more information we gather, the better we'll be able to assess actually the, the scope and the magnitude of this issue. Um, so this report is presented to you for information and uh, we're invited to take its, uh, its content, particularly its, con and its uh, conclusions into the decision-making process, which is reflected in draft resolution six uh, on seabird issues. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, <clears throat> for the report. Any um, request for the floor? I see Estonia. Um, I see UNEP and uh, and Wetlands International. Okay, we'll, we'll start with Estonia. Thank you, Chair. The EU and its member states recognize the work done by the uh, RSPB and the Bill Life International Global uh, Seabus Program on the uh, assessment of the potential impacts of plastic uh, to migratory seabirds. Mm, uh, we welcome the uh, document item uh, of 7.28 as an important step uh, to enhance uh, the planning of uh, responses to water birds' uh, declines and take its conclusions and recommendations into account in the decision-making process. EU and its member states uh, suggest uh, softening uh, the uh, operable section of the draft resolution uh, in a few areas uh, in order to allow scope for uh, discretion as uh, regard the use of guidance, for example, um, in the operable paragraph one, to use approve, and in the operable paragraphs uh, three and six to use encourage. We propose uh, further refinement and uh, prioritization of actions by the technical committee of the uh, list of uh, preliminary priorities, which is recognized already in the draft uh, resolution. Uh, EU and its member states would like to emphasize that the impact um, of bycatch uh, can also be addressed uh, by preventive measures that uh, aspect could be uh, better reflected in the draft resolution. And we suggest uh, some minor changes in wording in uh, paragraph uh, 1.3 to avoid uh, ambiguity, uh, and in paragraph 1.4 to adjust the wording uh, of invasive uh, non-native species impacts. We also propose to add uh, in the draft resolution preamble or uh, text uh, on uh, line 125 
a reference to the third resolution of the uh, UNEA, resolution uh, 3 slash 7 on marine litter and uh, microplastics from 2017. And uh, in the document Iowa MOP uh, 7.30, uh, page 3, point uh, 13 in uh, C, D and D, the EU policies uh, should refer to the European Union and not the European Commission. And we will uh, send the exact proposals and write writing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Estonia. Um, UNEP. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very important report. Um, uh, as you know, UNEP, uh, the governing body of UN Environment, the UNEA 3, placed high priority on pollution and its theme uh, towards a pollution-free world. And it has prepared a background document on uh, pollutants, and the uh, secretariats of multilateral environmental agreements have contributed to this report. Right now, we are in the process of preparing um, a mitigation report, uh, implementation, um, pollution implementation report, and the CMS Secretariat has contributed to this report. It will be submitted in our next uh, theme of the UNEA 4 in March 2019. And we think this report would be very instrumental uh, in being incorporated to the pollution implement uh, implementation report uh, because of the high priority of uh, pollutants, including plastics and other metals like lead shots and um, other, uh, other chemicals. It is a very, um, it is now a uh, cross-cutting issue uh, as important as climate change, and we are really placing high priority on uh, this matter. So uh, thank you for that, and we invite you to, I mean, uh, to uh, incorporate this, the findings of this report into the implementation report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Junep. Um, Wetlands International. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm just a little bit wondering that yesterday we heard from Florian that the theme of the World Migratory Bird Day relates to the, to the plastic. And you presented that it's a relatively low population level impact. So how can you consolidate these two things? What do you expect contracting parties and partners to communicate about? Okay, Sergey, if uh, you would like to, to respond. Well, that's something that needs to be conferred with the communication team. Uh, obviously, uh, we have a report which suggests, uh, at least for the AVA populations, uh, limited impact, at least at population level. But uh, uh, so as it was already mentioned, uh, the level of knowledge is probably not sufficient, it's geographically biased. So there is actually a communication message that could be distilled from this. It just needs to be done carefully uh, you know, because um, um, we, we have documentation uh, at our end. Uh, we have conclusions uh, done uh, in, a, in an appropriate way, scientific way. Um, so um, it just has to be considered by the communication team together with uh, with the rest of the secretariats, not only AWA, it goes beyond uh, AWA. Um, and uh, let's not forget that uh, this, the, the World Migratory Bird Day is a global initiative. It concerns uh, all birds uh, globally. Uh, so this is just a subset, taxonomic subset of, uh, of the bird species in the world. And also geographically, as we saw, it's, it's very limited. Uh, so. We have to look at uh, actually what is the issue in, in other bird tax, uh, uh, certain pelagic species, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I think this needs to be checked carefully before the communication actually is, is launched. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
we'll now move on to the item um, on Iowa priorities for seabeds. Um, Nina will take us through that. It's document 7.29. Document 7.29. Okay, so as the final item, uh, one of the final before lunch, uh, to quickly go through the um, priorities for uh, seabird conservation, the document. Um, so globally, as you know, seabirds are one of the most threatened groups of uh, birds. And uh, out of the 84 seabirds covered by the agreement, we have 16 that are listed as vulnerable or endangered. 11 is near threatened, and uh, the global populations of 39 species are in decline. And at MOP6, um, there was a request to the AWA Technical Committee to provide advice on the most urgent seabird uh, conservation priorities from an AWA perspective. And uh, as a result, the Technical Committee has produced this uh, really broad prioritization as a first step in establishing AWA's niche and uh, potential added value in terms of seabird conservation. And uh, we have a wide range of threats and challenges facing AWA seabirds, so the prioritization was uh, based on the following, following uh, themes. Species status and population trend, actions that would address multiple priorities as well as multiple species, um, actions where AWA can add value to avoid overlap with existing uh, frameworks and initiatives, and actions which will support the implementation of the draft strategic plan expected to be adopted by this meeting. And so the propose, proposal is to fo focus the initial um, seabird-related re action uh, on addressing seven conservation challenges in particular. First one is bycatch and fishing gear, um, to fill seabird bycatch data gaps throughout the AWA range, to assess the extent and impact of bycatch by artisanal fisheries to AWA-listed seabirds, and to feed, feed this bycatch data into a flyway assessment of the cumulative impact of seabird mortality. The next challenge to be addressed, human impacts on prey. By assessing the impact of artisanal or recreational fisheries on prey and ensuring regular representation on selected priority regional fisheries management organizations or RFMOs through a collaborative approach with other conservation frameworks. The next challenge, hunting and egg harvesting, so forms of taking, uh, to gather data on seabird harvest assess the extent and impact of direct seabird harvest of AWOLIS species by artisanal fisheries again, and to carry out a flyway level assessment of the cumulative impact of seabird mortality. So basically, the idea is to bring together the information from all of these different forms of take, um, whether intentional or not, so that we really have a good overview. Uh, the next challenge is related to invasive species predation and the activities proposed are to identify those seabird colonies where the threat from alien predators is, is significant and to prioritize those for action, as well as to review and assess available alien predator control, removal, and eradication measures, and to provide best practice guidance to parties. Next challenge is mortality from oil spills and contaminants, uh, where the activities proposed are to identify the key coastal and at-sea areas where responses to oil spills would be most urgently needed, and also to liaise with the identified rele relevant frameworks to ensure that AWA seabirds and seabird sites are adequately represented within existing regional oil spill plans. Next challenge is disturbance and mortality from at-sea developments. And here the suggested activity is to address impacts of offshore wind farms on AWA seabird species in the North Sea and Baltic Sea. Next challenge is identification and protection of priority sites by filling gaps in the critical site network for seabirds and protecting and managing these identified critical sites. And the action requested from this meeting is to uh, take into consideration the conclusions and recommendations presented by the technical committee and uh, to adopt the suggested priorities in the draft resolution six on uh, priorities for the conservation of seabirds. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we'll now open the floor for any principal comments or questions. I don't see any request for the floor. 
Um, thank you very much. We still again refer you to draft resolution 7.6 for all those items that we, we've dealt with, including the guide to guidance to reduce the impacts on fisheries, which we haven't gone through. Um, we are going to take um, announcements because we want to break for lunch, requesting parties to make sure that we are back here by 2 o'clock so that we can start exactly at 2 o'clock. It would mean that the, uh, those responsible for side events can release people five minutes before 2 o'clock so that we can, we can start. We're still trying to catch up. We are still hopeful that we can. Um, we have some few announcements to make, um, if you can note that, because they pertain to what happens between now and, and 2 o'clock, and we we'll request uh, Seji to take us through those, uh, those announcements. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's not really announcements. We just want to put these slides here. So you, we assume that you all have the schedule for the side events, but we'll be keeping these slides throughout the meeting with the side events for the lunch breaks and for the evenings respectively, so that you could find your way to the respective rooms. Uh, after lunch, we expect a short report from the credentials committee on the status of submission and acceptance of credentials and then we'll proceed with the rest of the agenda. As you have seen, we, uh, the Chair has uh, taken a decision in consultation with the Secretary to shorten some presentations or skip certain presentations because uh, we really need to, to conclude by 4 o'clock to allow the working groups to have sufficient time to address all these technicalities that have some of them have, have been mentioned already in the plenary. So uh, we would like to, to call upon you to be very punctual and uh, you know, um, at two o'clock and also to keep your statements as short as possible on the issues. You'll have plenty of opportunities to actually address <coughs> specific wording or more specific comments in the working group sessions. So please, uh, when you make your statements, consider that and make just principal, uh, principal statements here in the plenary. We have only two hours left between two o'clock and four o'clock when we're breaking, uh, or we're, we're, when we're actually supposed to conclude the afternoon plenary session, and we still have quite some business. We're at least 45 minutes behind schedule. So thank you in advance. Okay, the meeting is suspended up until two o'clock. <laughs>